I invite you to stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Um, it is the uh, Holy Thursday, the Mass of our Lord's, the Lord's Supper. Um, at this Mass, we not only commemorate um, our Lord Jesus, who, who came not to be served, but to serve. We not only remember the institution of the priesthood, we also are here because we recognize that Jesus, on this night, he gave us the gift of the Eucharist. He gave us the gift of himself. He gave us the he gave us true worship. He gave us the sacrifice of this himself to the Father that gets completed at Calvary. Actually, it doesn't even get completed all the way. There's a whole theology behind it through the resurrection act, actually ascension into heaven. But our Lord Jesus Christ, on this night, he gave us the gift of the Eucharist. Yeah, um, earlier in, in the day, today, uh, a lot of dioceses around the world, the priests have a chrism mass. We in the Diocese of Duluth, we have it on Monday because the diocese is kind of big. So at that chrism mass, Two things happen. One is the oils that are for the oil of the sick, the oil of catechumens, the oil of um, anointing, the chrism oil, gets blessed by the bishop. And that was awesome. That was on Monday. Um, but also the priests get to renew their vows, renew their promises to the Lord, to be able to say in the presence of the bishop, in the presence of the church, in the presence of God himself, Lord God, for all the ways that I've failed to be a, the priest that you've called me to be, I just, I recommit my whole heart, life, everything to say yes to you, to those promises that I made so many years ago. It's just an incredible gift. I love that Mass. But at the beginning of every single Mass, we get to do that. We get to say, Lord, you've called me. You've made me your son. You've made me your daughter. You are my father. I haven't always lived like a son. I haven't always lived like a daughter. But tonight, the beginning of this Mass of the Lord's Supper, when he gave us the Eucharist, when he gave us the priesthood, we get to renew those promises. As we come before the Lord recognizing, I have not lived as a child of God, but God, you are my dad. And I ask you to make me new. And so we pray. Lord Jesus, you came to call sinners. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to seek and to save the lost. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You lived to intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. And on earth, peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who have called us to participate in this most sacred supper, in which your only begotten Son, when about to hand himself over to death, entrusted to the church a sacrifice new for all eternity, a banquet, the banquet of his love. Grant, we pray, that we may draw from so great a mystery the fullness of charity and of life through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we hear from God's word. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this, this month shall stand at the head of your calendar. You shall reckon it the first month of the year. Tell the whole community of Israel, On the tenth of this month, every one of your families must procure for itself a lamb, one apiece for each household. If a family is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join the nearest household in procuring one, and shall share in the lamb, 
in proportion to the number of persons who partake of it. The lamb must be a year old male and without blemish. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, and then, with the whole assembly of Israel present, it shall be slaughtered during the evening twilight. They shall, they shall take some of its blood and apply it to the two doorposts and the lintel and every house in which they partake of the lamb. That same night they shall eat its roasted flesh with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. This is how you are to eat it. With your loins girt, sandals on your feet, and your staff in hand, you shall eat like those who are in flight. It is the Passover of the Lord. For on this same night I will go through Egypt, striking down every firstborn of the land, both man and beast, and executing judgment on all the gods of Egypt, I, the Lord. But the blood will mark the houses where you are. Seeing the blood, I will pass over you. Thus, when I strike the land of Egypt, no destructive blow will come upon you. This day shall be a memorial feast for you, which all your generation shall, shall celebrate, which pilgrimage to the Lord as a perpetual institution. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. of the A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 15. Before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to pass from this world to the Father. He loved his own in the world, and he loved them to the end. The devil had already induced Judas, the son of Simon the Iscariot, to hand him over. So during supper, fully aware that the Father had put everything in his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God, he rose from supper and took off his outer garments. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Master, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will understand later. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, Unless I wash you, you will have no inheritance with me. Simon Peter said to him, Master, then not only my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus responded to him, Whoever has bathed has no need except to have his feet washed, for he is clean all over. So you are clean, but not all. For he knew who would betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and put his garments back on and reclined at table again, he said to them, Do you realize what I have done for you? You call me teacher and master, and rightly so, for indeed I am. If I, therefore, the master and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you a model to follow, so that as I have done for you, you should also do. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I you to have a seat. So for the last number of weeks, this whole Lent, we've been talking about the power of words and how yeah, words have the ability. They have the ability to disclose. They have the ability to define a person's life. They have the ability to reveal what's in a person's heart, what they really care about um, the most. In fact, one of the things that words have the ability to disclose or reveal is the state of one's mind, especially at the end of one's life. Those last words a person has have the ability to reveal the state of a person's soul. Like, are, are they at peace? Are they in distress? Are they in a place of, of torment? Are they in a place of, of rest? It, it kind of, those, those words, they, they give us insight into the perspective of a person. They, here's what I mean. Uh, there was, we've gone through a bunch of last words in the last number of, of weeks. One of my favorites was from Charlie Chaplin. At one point, as Charlie Chaplin is dying, his last words, a priest came to visit him. And as he was received the Holy Communion and received anointing of the sick, Charlie Chaplin was Catholic, um, as far as I understand it at least. Uh, the priest said to Charlie Chaplin in this, these words of peace, he said, may God have mercy on your soul, which is just what a great word. May God have mercy on your soul. And uh, Charlie Chaplin's response was, his last words were, why wouldn't he? It already belongs to him. Just that, that, those words of confidence. Those, that, that, that last word of, that's my perspective. So the word perspective is so remarkable. Perspective means to see through, to look through, is to have a perspective. And so one's perspective is, is the lens, right? The first, one's perspective is the lens through which you look at everything, look at the entire world. In fact, here's Charlie Chaplin who, and his last words, the last moment of his life, may God have mercy on your soul, why wouldn't he? It already belongs to him. That was his perspective. That was his lens. In fact, our lens, our perspective, the way we see the world, it, it, it changes the way we see everything, right? It, it changes the way we see events. It changes the way we see uh, victories in our lives, or the way we see defeats. Our perspective, our lens changes the way we see our gifts. Are these accidental or they own? It changes the way we see struggle. It changes the way we see love. It changes the way our lens changes the way we see suffering. In fact, our lens changes the way we see even death. Even the quick or the slow process of sickness and aging and dying. Our perspective will tell us everything, will reveal everything. And it comes out in those last words. So yesterday, on Wednesday, this movie came out. Um, it's starring Mark Wahlberg and Mel Gibson. It's called Father Stu. It's about this man named Stuart Long um, who ends up becoming a priest. But in Stewart's, I got to watch this movie last week, and um, 
And Stuart's early life, he was raised without any religion at all, basically. So his whole family, it was, it was him, his older brother, his mom and his dad, and they were relatively pretty indifferent to God. So in fact, he tells the story about how when he went to college, he went to a Catholic college and he played football for them. At one point, the coach said, you have to go to, you know, what we have to do if you're on this team, you're gonna go to chapel. And so he didn't even know, he didn't know what a chapel was. He had no, I mean, no idea. He said he walked into the chapel and he saw an image of a man with wings and a sword standing over a man on the ground with horns. It like literally didn't even know the concept of here's angels and devils, had no concept of God. He was indifferent to God. But at some point, what happened was when he was still young, I think six years old, his older brother died in his sleep. And what that did to his family in so many ways is it, it broke his family. So they were largely indifferent to the Lord. But whenever God, the topic of God came up, they were filled with hatred. I mean, just like in the movie, it captures this. And also, by the way, just kind of a, a, a public service announcement. Um, there's a lot of F-bombs, a lot of language in the movie. It's rated R for a reason because it's trying to capture this absolute anger, this absolute hostility that Stu and his father and his mother had not only for each other, but have for God because that was their, their, their two lenses where either I'm indifferent to God or I'm angry, like have a rage against God. And so in, in his life, a lot, number of things happened. That, you know, not only did his brother die, at some point he was going to be a boxer. And then he had a problem with his jaw. He, could, he had to give up that dream. And then at one point he was like, I'm going to be an actor. And at some point Edward would give up that dream. And at one point even actually, he was following this girl to, uh, to date her basically. And she said, well, I'm baptized. So you won't date me in the, unless you're baptized. So he goes, joins RCIA. In the process of this, maybe he even gets baptized, he gets in this motorcycle accident and gets run over by a car after hitting. It's just one bad thing after another happens to him. And again, whenever he approached God, it was either indifference or hatred. But then at some point, something changes. He has a new lens. And that, that new lens is, is reveals that there's another option besides indifference. There's another option besides hatred. And it's this final last word that Jesus utters from the cross. In Luke's gospel, he says it like this. This is Luke chapter 23. Luke says, It was now about noon, and darkness, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Then the veil of the temple was torn down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. You know, Matthew and Mark, they both say that Jesus cried out. I think John even says that Jesus cried out. But Luke's the only one who says what, he sa what Jesus said when he cried out. Jesus' last words. We had the first last words. We had the next five last words. This is the final last word of Jesus himself. And the final last word is this loud cry, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. We have to ask the question, like, what is being said? What is Jesus actually saying this? Because I, I, all the six leading up to this moment, all six last words leading up to this moment have been important. They've been so critical for us. But this last word, this final last word, reveals the posture of Jesus. It reveals the perspective of Jesus. It, re it reveals how Jesus not only approached this last moment where he gave up his spirit, it reveals how Jesus approached everything. Because we could ask the question, how could have Jesus approached this moment? How could, what could Jesus' perspective have been? He could have been looking at this reality and said, like, I did everything right. Jesus could have looked at himself on the cross and all these people abandoning, betraying. And he could have said, I did everything right. I served the Father just exactly the way he asked me to do. This is not fair. He could have railed against this. He could have claimed that it wasn't fair. He could have claimed that it was unjust. And he would have been right. He would, he, would have, he would have been the only person in history who could have said, this shouldn't be happening to me. And he would actually be telling the truth. He could be railing against heaven. He could be crying out against God or he could even be the opposite. He could, the opposite, he could be indifferent. He could be apathetic. He could be like some, some of those like stoic heroes who just say, no, I'm, gonna, I'm going to accept my fate without a word, without a whimper, with no emotion, just strong, like cold. Again, apathetic. But he doesn't. He doesn't do either of those things. He's not indifferent to his own death. And he's also not raging against his death. He speaks to God with his last breath. And in that last breath, how does he talk to God? Once again, just like that first last word where, Father, forgive them, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Basically, that, that word 
he says, is Abba. The final last word of Jesus. He's talking to his dad. If you've followed uh, the Bible in a year, you probably know this. You know that uh, the very first month of the whole Bible, we go through Genesis, of course, because that's where the Bible starts. It makes sense. But at some point, someone decided, they, they were really smart, and they decided, you know, we also need to start with Job. So we begin those first 30 days reading Genesis and Job together. And so people who are just being introduced to the Bible in a comprehensive way, their first introduction is the story of this man, Job. Which is so important because why? Because what's Job's story? Job's story is that he was a righteous man. He did everything right. He did nothing wrong. In fact, God even says this in chapter 1, that Job didn't do anything wrong. Look at how righteous Job is. But then, God allows Job to experience incredible loss. First, he, he loses his, his wealth. Then he loses the people he loves the most. He loses his children. They all die. And then Job loses his health. And at first, Job is patient with it. At first, Job says, yeah, blessed be the Lord. He gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But after a bit, Job wants to know why. After a bit, Job wants to know why. And so these three friends come along and they start trying to tell Job why, plus a fourth friend who's not really a friend. And they're not really, they're, try, they're trying to tell Job, here's the reason why these things are happening to you. But all those answers are impartial. They're, they're, none of them are accurate and none of them are helpful until God shows up. And it's really interesting. So I read the book of Job my first, the first time ever, I think I was in high school or college, somewhere in there. Someone told me that if you want to, if you ever struggle with the problem of evil, the reality of suffering in this life, here is God's answer to the reality of suffering. So I remember reading the book of Job and being incredibly disappointed because when God does show up, what he basically says is, Job, were you there when I created the stars? Job, were you there when I created the depth of the ocean? Job, do you even know all of the animals? You don't even know half the animals that live on the face of the earth. Also, did you know why I put the planets in motion? Like all these kind of things. And basically, I'm thinking, God, when are you going to give, when are you going to tell Job why he's going through all this? Because God doesn't do that. But at the end of it all, Job doesn't, God doesn't tell Job why. He doesn't give Job a why. I think I know the reason why. I think I know the reason why God doesn't give Job a why is because he knows that that wouldn't actually be the answer. It might be a answer. It might be a temporary answer. It might be the answer to God's, to, Job, to, to, to Job's suffering today. It might be an answer to Job's suffering right now. But then what happens tomorrow? What happens with tomorrow's suffering? What happens with tomorrow's pain? What happens with the question that comes up again tomorrow? God would have to just be waiting in the wings always for Job when he has this next pain, when he has his next question, when he has his next trial, to say, oh, this is why you're going through this now. And the same thing is true for all of us. God doesn't give Job a why. When he shows up, God gives Job a who. And that is changes Job's lens. That changes Job's perspective completely. In fact, at the end of the book of Job, after God ceases to speak, Job says, I had heard of you before. People had told me about you in the past. But now I've seen you. Now I've met you, essentially. And I take back my words. I repent in dust and ashes. Because again, God doesn't give Job a why. He gives Job a who. And so Job can basically say, no matter what happens now, I know you. My perspective is not, I'm indifferent to pain. My perspective is not, I'm angry at pain. My perspective is now, I trust you in my pain. And that's the final last word. That has been Jesus' word ever since the moment of the incarnation until this last moment, this final moment of his life. And the ultimate moment of his loss, Jesus turns to God and he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He says, Dad, I trust you. Imagine this. In the moment of loss, this is the end of the story. With betrayal, and denial, and abandonment, and humiliation, and suffering, and pain. And the only thing left is this last breath. With that last breath, Jesus simply says, Dad, I trust you. You know, so, so this is crazy. This is necessary for every one of us. Why? Because I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Um, 
Pope Benedict points this out. Point, ben, Pope Benedict pointed out the fact that for ancient man, for, all, for, for centuries of Christianity, human beings, we realized that we were guilty. We realized that we had failed to love God the way he's called us to love. We failed to love each other the way God has called us to love each other. And so we're guilty. And so the perspective is we're in a courtroom and we're on trial. And what happens is God steps into the courtroom and he answers our guilt with the cross. That the cross becomes the price for our sin. That the cross becomes God's answer for our sin. But something happened in the last not very long, decades to a century, what's happened is modern man, what we do is we bring into the courtyard, come into the, court, or into the courtroom, we come into the courtroom with God and we say, God, you're guilty. Why? Because you made this world and you let it break. And now you're making, you're making us live in this world where there's suffering and there's evil and there's pain and there's death. And so God, what modern man says is, God, you're on trial. It's still a courtroom. But now God's on trial. This is the crazy thing. Pope Benedict highlighted this. He pointed this out. He said, just like in the ancient, for the ancient world, for the ancient man, the cross was God's answer for man's sin. The cross was God's price that he paid for our sin. The cross is still the answer. The cross is the price that God paid for our doubt. The cross is God's answer for our lack of trust. It's the same answer, it's the same cross, it's the same Jesus who with his last breath says, Father, I trust you even when I'm losing everything. As I'm giving everything, I trust you. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, what more does God have to do before you'll begin to trust him too? What more does God have to do before we can look at any situation and any season and any suffering in our lives and still say, this hurts and this is painful and I don't like it and, Dad, I trust you. Because that's the lens that changes everything. I'm not indifferent to suffering. I'm not, I'm not raging against God in my suffering. But I'm like Father Stu and this is the last thing. One of Father Stu's messages, not just in the movie, but in his life, what happened was after Father Stu got ordained, actually before he got ordained, he was diagnosed with a, what has the symptoms of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And he could be the kind of person who would say, God, I did everything right, but he didn't. He could have said, I'm indifferent to it, I'm a tough guy, but he didn't. What he said is, I understand, death comes to all of us. This comes to all of us. This pain is real in all of our lives. But no matter what happens, the lens, the perspective is going to be trust. And that's one of the, I think that's the reason why they made a movie about this man's life. Not because he died this heroic life, strong and incredible and doing heroic things. It's because even as his perspective was changed, his lens was changed from indifference to God to anger to God, at some point he realized, I can trust God. And then when all these things happened to him, all these things came upon him and his life was being drained away day by day and he became weaker and weaker, unable to move, unable to feed himself, unable to use the bathroom on his own, unable to do all these things, he consistently said, but I know that I can trust my Father in heaven. I know that God is my dad. And just like Jesus, I can trust him. And this is the power of the final last word. That the final last word of Jesus is meant to actually be our first word. The final last word of Jesus, this act of trust, is meant to actually be the very first word that you and I can utter every time we get out of bed in the, in the morning. Every time we go to sleep at night, we get to say the final last word of Jesus as our first word. And that word not only will disclose the reality of our heart and the reality of the truth of life, it will also define our lives. That with Jesus, we can say, Father, no matter what happens to me, into your hands I commend my spirit. That we can say, Dad, no matter what happens to me, I trust you.
I invite you to stand as we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident in our Father's love for us, we approach him now with all of our needs. In thanksgiving for the gift of the Lord's body and blood, and for the grace to worship him fervently and receive him worthily, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. That the Lord, who gave the church on this night the gift of the priesthood, may bless and strengthen every priest with a gift of deep holiness and pastoral charity. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That our gratitude for the gift of the Eucharist on this night may strengthen our solidarity with the poor, the lonely, and the unborn. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For all who will receive the sacraments this Easter, for their sponsors and their families, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For deeper unity among all Christians, an end to divisions, and a spirit of forgiveness and collaboration, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer that those who are ill may be strengthened and that those who have died may be welcomed into eternal joy. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. We continue our prayer for vocations for the Diocese of Duluth, but also for your diocese and dioceses throughout the world as we pray. Almighty Father, we beg you for an increase in religious vocations and holy marriages in our diocese. Help us to be generous in our response to your call. Choose from our homes those who are needed for your work and strengthen us with the courage to say yes and to follow you. Help us as a diocese, as a parish, as families, to encourage and foster vocations to the priesthood, permanent diaconate, and consecrated life. We commend our prayers to our patroness, Mary, Queen of the Rosary, and ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our benefit of all his holy church. Grant, O Lord, we pray, that we may participate worthily in these mysteries, for whenever the memorial of this sacrifice is celebrated, the work of our redemption is accomplished through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For he is the true and eternal priest who instituted the pattern of everlasting sacrifice and was the first to offer himself as the saving victim. 
commanding us to make this offering as his memorial. As we eat his flesh that was sacrificed for us, we are made strong. And as we drink his blood that was poured out for us, we are washed clean. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Daniel, our Bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants for whom we now pray. and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and for all who are dear to them, in hope of health and well-being, for the redemption of their souls, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. Celebrating the most sacred day on which our Lord Jesus Christ was handed over for our sake, and in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, the mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, James, Thomas, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, which we make to you as we observe the day on which our Lord Jesus Christ handed on the mysteries of his body and blood for his disciples to celebrate. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer for our salvation and the salvation of all, that is, today, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts you've given us, this holy victim, this pure victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gift of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty. 
so that all of us, who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with a sign of faith and now rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. An act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
This is the body that will be given up for you. This is the chalice of the new covenant in my blood, says the Lord. Do this whenever you receive it in memory of me. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 and 25. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, that just as we are renewed by the supper of your Son in this present age, so we may enjoy his, enjoy his banquet for all eternity, who lives and reigns forever and ever. See.